All right. Now, um, in addition to Family Connection, there's plenty of websites out there. Um, I could take up three slides showing you all the different scholarship websites. Uh, you could you could Google scholarships and you'll you'll get the phone book. So you know, like I said, finding the scholarships is the easy part. Uh, it's it's the actual application process. Okay, beware of any scholarship that asks you for money. No scholarship organization should be asking you for money, asking you for credit card information, bank account information. Stay away from those. Okay. Um, when, you're, when, when you guys become seniors, you're gonna start getting these emails, like, you know, $10,000 for college, just click here and enter your credit card number here, okay, look out for those, okay, because, I mean, as a senior year in high school, you're, 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 you're vulnerable, they know you're looking for money, so, you know, unfortunately, you're gonna have somewhat of a target on your back of uh, scams uh, looking to get money out of you, okay? Um, the sweepstakes, it's, you know, not necessarily, may not necessarily be a scam, but just understand that the sweepstakes scholarships, it's kind of a, you know, it's a drawing, you know, so it's not really based on um, your essay or you as a person. It's kind of like a luck of the draw type deal, okay? And uh, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to do a quick overview. This is my information. Uh, feel free to email me or call me if you have any questions. And uh, thank you for coming out. Okay, can we get another round of applause for all of our panelists? Wow, a lot of wonderful information. Okay, now what we want to make sure to do, uh, I want to respect you all's time. Uh, we really, about just about 15 minutes beyond where I, I thought we might be at this point. Um, but we don't want to omit the question and answer period. So what I want to just do is if we could take about two minutes, if you have to excuse yourself right now, we just want to give you a second to do so. Um, but we're going to take about 15 minutes of a Q&A. Before you start moving, um, I know we have one more thing just for planning uh, purposes. We need to ask a quick question. I'm going to let Ms. Ferguson do that. So believe it or not, we're already starting to talk about your senior year in our department. And we're talking about the fact that the FAFSA is going to be available on October 1st next year which means somehow we have to cram financial aid night and back to school night and senior parent night all into September. So one of the ideas that we had was, could we do senior parent night where we go over the whole admissions process and financial aid night, it would be a long program and you could opt out of the financial aid if you wanted to. But that may be the best way to get all of the information for you all before October 1st. Can I see a show of hands how many people would prefer to do something like that on a weekday evening or a Saturday. So everybody for weekday evening, raise your hand, okay. And people who would prefer to do that on a Saturday morning, okay. It's probably about even. Okay, you didn't help us at all, thanks. So stay tuned for that. We'll be trying to figure that one out. We thought we might get lucky and see all the hands in one direction. But if you need to excuse yourselves again, thank you all for coming out. Uh, we are going to take about a 15 minute uh, question and answer period. So for those of you who can stay, uh, please prepare your questions. We're going to come around uh, with the other mic. Uh, and I believe I am the designated other mic man. So panel is ready. I'm going to walk here, have my Oprah moment. No prizes though. Does anyone have a question they'd like to start with? Show of hands. Question, question. Oh, I see you, coming. Super scoring. The SAT has basically been reconfigured the third time in my career. The first time they recentered the SAT and 
What was interesting, anyone could pick up anywhere from 80 to 100 additional points the way they recentered the SAT at that point in time. Critical reading, math, and writing, which they just added this last time, students from Hayfield High School had very high, high writing scores because you can't get out of here unless you're a strong writer. So that was really much, very much a positive. They went back to 1600 with the new score, new scoring, and writing will be optional, and it's going to be interesting. It's not going to be the same way it's scored as is the present time. But in our case, we do take uh, the old SAT of what you're getting ready to change, highest critical reading, math, highest critical reading, math, and writing, and then with the ACT, the highest composite. We're not really doing any cherry picking on that, but it, it depends on the universities. And another thing about speaking of the SAT, uh, since it is some, a big change with the SAT, some universities such as Virginia Tech will only be accepting the new version of the SAT for you all this upcoming year. So that's a very important question to ask. If you've already taken the SAT and have no intentions of taking it again, you should contact all your prospective schools of interest to ask that policy. Because at Virginia Tech, it, we get a lot of phone calls about that right now. But for you, for this cohort that's graduating next year, our university is no longer taking the older version of the SAT, just the new version or the ACT. And there are a few others out there, not too many though. I actually want to point out in the back, this is a Q&A for the college people, but we actually have a Hayfield graduate who is currently on a full scholarship at Virginia Tech. Her name is Rahel Bagali, she's back in the back. She was also a member of our AVID program here at Hayfield. She's one of our shining stars and one of our uh, alums that we are most proud of. So if any of you students maybe would like her advice and kind of getting through senior year, getting through junior year, um, you know, she has some great advice. She may want to say hello to you after the program. Anybody else have a question? My question uh, involves AP courses. Having looked at several schools and the admission criteria and the placement and so forth, it does depend on how you score that one day. And I know that not all schools accept AP and then those that do have varying degrees of score acceptance. That being aside, from the admissions perspective, how do you view a student who has maybe not a 4.0 or a 4.5 with APs, but has taken a very heavy AP workload and maybe has not a 4.0 average, but certainly maybe above a 3.0. I love this question because I usually phrase it like this, um, and I can't remember who brought it up, but they said it very similarly. There is no such thing as the 4.0 that we knew when we were growing up, right, because of waiting, right? So um, <clears throat> for what does still have importance to us is the kind of course that you're sitting in and how you are doing in that course, the success in that course. And for those of us who read applications, we are reading transcripts. So while we do have a GPA that's on there, we can see the A's and the B's and the C's and the D's in those courses. So a student with a heavy duty workload and a, and a full AP curriculum or an IB curriculum who is doing well in those courses, I, not to speak on behalf, everybody's behalf, but I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep about what that two digit number is. I'm going to be more concerned with how successful that student is doing in those classes. So if I'm looking at a B student, I'm fine with a B student knowing that this is the kind of course load that student has gotten to be in. Now, that'll vary school to school, that'll vary with selectivity of universities. Harvard is not sitting up here, for example, so uh, I can't speak on their behalf. Uh, but for those of us who read applications, uh, the, the, we want to be assured that you're going to come to our school and be successful in the classroom. If we're confident in that, then things like numbers don't always have the ultimate importance. And just to, to tag on to it a bit, since um, Ms. Ferguson used our Virginia Tech as an example in our little scattergram earlier, you would have noticed that we had a pretty high GPA profile on that sheet. And um, kind of speaking to what um, Ms. Wagner was just saying, uh, Virginia Tech, we look for A's and B's in the most rigorous course load. So with that being said, we do expect AP level coursework, but we do expect A's and B's in that coursework, which would correspond with a higher GPA. But like um, Lauren was saying, it's not the GPA per se that we're looking at, it's A's and B's in the rigor.
graduated to being able to work three mic setups. Uh, a question for financial aid um, for non-citizens. Uh, Pell Grant and uh, direct student loan and, and other aid. Uh, if they're recently uh, relocated from, from overseas. Well, um, you, you actually do need, either need a social security number or alien registration number. That was impressive. <laughs> I used to be able to do that, <laughs> but about 80 pounds ago. Um, so yes, you either do need a uh, social security number or alien registration number in order to um, be eligible for federal, uh, federal aid. Uh, as far as institutional aid, uh, private scholarships, that's a different story. But as far as federal aid, you would either need the social security number or alien registration number. Okay, uh, well, this question for Ms. Ferguson, but I first I want to thank the panelists for uh, uh, the insightful and all the great information. Would you uh, possibly have the slides that some of them have shared on your uh, YouTube site? Uh, because we didn't really get... Yes. We'll have to get his stick back from him again. Okay. So I know that a bunch of you guys come from a variety of school levels, like Virginia Tech is pretty high up and everything. What is usually the lowest score on AP exams that you guys accept? Since I know a lot of colleges will only accept fours or fives, but some will accept threes as well. Quick question, you, you mentioned that there are some anomalies in a, in a student's transcript or record or whatever. Um, you, the panel mentioned, uh, make sure that's reflected somewhere on the application. What would you suggest to be placed on that application? Uh, we're called, we're called explain, don't complain. That's serious, it's an opportunity, to, it's an email or a letter from a student to an admissions person generally the university business pay deal to actually step to explain the extent of your circumstances. It's really helpful because the essay we're fishing for something, personal statement we're fishing again, explained over complain just really gives us a clear, concise reason why something may have happened. Health issues, there are a number of other things that can happen, death and family, and we will look at a record and all of a sudden, what the heck is going on? And that's where we have a chance to see someone. And it, in a type of a concept, is it called explain over complain, to come off whining. Because I've had people use their personal statement option, which could be just one more thing to shove it over the fence, and they just talk about an issue that goes away from it. And we want to try to find as many positive things as possible, but there isn't something that's abnormal or odd. 
It's good to have an express but it needs to come from the student. Sometimes they get students will give a counselor permission to explain it in the counselor's statement, but sometimes they do not want to do it, and at a later date, we sometimes they will tell us about it. But it's something where it needs to come from the student. There's also uh, an additional comment section on you know, the common application and any institutional application. And that'll be another really good area to kind of reflect that information right Thank you. Uh, this question is directed to, I guess it's Mr. Smith at Nova. I heard you speak about the guaranteed admission, and it's in, I think you said that you know, depending on the GPA and so forth, um, the student would then would be admitted to the institution, but then there's a separate, of course, process to the particular college or, or maybe the, the degree kind of program. Given historical data, what is your um, uh, experience, or do you have any data to show that students who were admitted to the institution were also subsequently admitted to the college with, without any difficulty, or can you shed some light on that? Uh, yes. Uh, well, most of our students, we, you know, as a first year advisor, I'm working with them to lay out their plan. We lay out their two year plan um, before they leave us going on to the four year school. So, what we do is a lot of schools have transfer guides, have roadmaps. So, what we do is we tailor their particular program at NOVA to make sure that they not only take care of the requirements for NOVA, but they're mostly taking care of the requirements at the four-year institution. That helps them to not only maintain the GPA, but also it allows them to make sure, you look and find, find some of those hidden classes sometimes, that the four-year institution, some of them are better than others as far as putting what those are, uh, that would help them get into the department. Uh, you know, like for instance, I'm uh, just helping a student uh, who's going to Mason. Our IT program requires pre-calculus 163 and apply calculus 271. But when you look on Mason's website, they don't accept 163. Uh, so they can take care of us, but then they're not going to be ready for Mason. So then I wouldn't encourage them to do 163. I would encourage them to do 166 or do, uh, do another higher river course to make sure that they are covered and everything, and that's our job as advisors, first year advisors, is to make sure that we map out those things for where they're looking to go. We always say, look at the end, where you want to end up, and then back up, and then we're going to help you get the target. It gets back to point two, uh, going even further in the process, uh, even first semester, whatever, you need to actually be in contact with somebody at the senior institution that early in the process. You may find two semesters, you can go, in most cases, four semesters, 65 semesters, first semester, junior, if you're right on target. But it's really having a chance to communicate with them. Every school is different. What we say, every the word depends, depends on each institution. And actively advising is that if they're, they're the uh, unsung heroes. Oh, uh, really? Unsung heroes are people in active advising because it's, it's a time, effort, money that's out there, and people change their minds eight ways from Sunday. You know, our jobs are at the time of life just like the one with the 17-year-old students. And you know how fast things change. And then what, what's really nice to see someone go to a place like Nova, really get on track, or was on track, stayed on track, for many reasons, do well, move to the next level. And it's just something, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are people who take many different roads to get to that final journey. And also, what you do with Nova, that's not 13th grade. It is really strong, and that strong active program, we have students who transfer from the many community campuses to our campus. They do really well academically, but it's back to that point of active advising. And that's the area where more people are worried about their sports life and things like that, and they're not worried about active advising. That's where that separates a lot of schools out how well they do. And then we're looking for outcomes right now, too. Who's going to graduate? Two years, four years, the six year graduation rate. People aren't really going to take the six years to get out of school. You want them out in four. And that's where it's transferring around and moving around. You can do it. I was 65 semester, I was first semester junior, graduate. It's a undergraduate. It'll work. So, who gets the last two questions of the night? One? There was one. Excuse me. I, 
I have another question about how you view AP classes, and I, I understand what you said about performance in the classes, but do you, do you, pref you know, as, as our students are selecting their courses they're gonna take, do you prefer to see a smaller number of more rigorous courses, or do you uh, like to see a kind of a larger number of, of um, classes on a, AP classes on a student's transcript? Some of the areas in Commonwealth, Virginia, even in North Carolina, 